students teach me more than I teach them at times. Um, um, sometimes several things happen. Sometimes someone blows you away with something and then you need to rethink what you're doing. This is not just graduate students. I used to teach second grade to pay for graduate school. <laughs> and I taught second grade Hebrew school, mm. which was um, you know, a religious school in Boston. And um, I once, and you know, I had this really tortured, complicated, existential, quasi-secular approach to God. And how could I be true to the tradition in which I am laboring, but also <laughs> teach in a way that was intellectually and existentially honest to myself without betraying something that I'm here to teach. Mm -hmm. And I had this, and at a second grade level, mm -hmm. not simple, mm -hmm. but I thought I did it. And we had this whole section on what prayer might be mm -hmm. and how to think about it mm -hmm. uh, as a kind of practice we do. And we would try out reading and thinking and writing uh, prayer, if you like. And I had the second grade uh, she must have been eight years old, and she just at one point said something as part of this that totally blew myself away. I mean, it was, I didn't get Kierkegaard at that moment. This was extraordinary. So anyway, uh, so this often happens. Um, but of course, other things happen too. And what did she say? I, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reduce it to, to triteness, by, but at the moment it wasn't that. She basically said, uh, you know, sometimes I come outside and I sit on the step and she didn't use the word sun dappled, but that's what it felt like. Mm -hmm. And she said, and it's warm, and I'm just sitting there, and you know, it's it's really nice. And that was her prayer. Mm -hmm. It was almost like a haiku. It was just something that was just so condensed as an image. Mm -hmm. That was, and the idea that a certain kind of, that moment, that worlding, that sitting in the sun, its limited possibility could be in a second grader. Mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I mean, you know, one might say one was in the face of God in that terrifying moment in just listening to her say that. And mm -hmm. so it was, okay, my students. Um, I like when someone can do several things. One of which is what I don't always do well, but I struggle to do, which is to, to I want to read something and know in the outset why this matters what the stakes are, what it's about. Even if the very writing is going to undo, unthink, unmake that. I want to have some place to start. Um, I want to be troubled in the reading, but I also want to have some ground which is friendly letting me in. Mm. There's different ways to do that in different disciplines, but uh, for me it's often just saying this is where I start. You know, my book begins with a section called The Ground of the Argument. Because it isn't even what my argument is, it's this is where I start. And where I in that book start is to say that how we think about bodies and time and how we produce a language to think about that um, comes to constitute how we produce politics. And age is critical to thinking about the language we have of making sense of the world. And I take this from the moment in my feminist training late in graduate school when I come to recognize that feminism over the 80s always grounded in multiple struggles, but just primarily focusing on gender hierarchy, to asking about how gender hierarchy is relevant to questions of the nation or race or colonialism, what would become intersectionalities, but at the moment we're also just using the critical pedagogy and tools of a feminist project to rethink the world. Mm -hmm. And I began to ask, how is the other axis of naturalizable difference, something that seems natural? Mm -hmm. It just mm -hmm. is. There just is gender. There just is age. So it carries power mm -hmm. in a certain kind of way. How that axis of difference makes worlds, unmakes worlds. And yet the question is, why has this not happened? Mm -hmm. Why has the ways in which forms of feminist practice or critical race theory makes demands or should make demands on scholar not happen by and large for age, mm -hmm. which remains a kind of understandably anxious concern that old people are treated like crap and this is a bad thing and I'm angry. Mm -hmm. But if that's all that the anthropology or the sociology of old age is, and if it isn't about radically unthinking the question of time, mm -hmm. um, then we're not doing something interesting. So so the, the I try to lay that out in a two or three paragraphs and say, 
this is what I care about. And this is a book about dementia. It's a book about a very different place. It's a, therefore, it's a book about colonialism, and therefore, it's a book about the contemporary world and value. But it's ultimately, this is my ground. And I want the reader to have that at square one. This is where I'm starting from. This is what I care about. This is my passion. And so I want, if it's a, a five-page or a 300-page book, I want them to have that sense of ground, which I will unmake, because as Derrida points out, the preface is always the preface to the next book, because in a sense, when I finally close my writing and say, this is my spade, I'm putting it to ground, this is where I stop, um, I'm doing so in part thinking where I'm going to go next, and so there's a lie to the preface. This isn't about what's going to come here, it's as much what's going to come in the next book, but as best I can, to say to the reader, this is what, at this moment, I care about, and this is how I read my book, and now you have to think about how you're going to read it. So I want them to have that. That's the first thing. The second thing is, for me, and this may be anthropology or maybe other kinds of writing, um, I want them to have um, a very rich structure of example. Mm -hmm. I always want to uh, work the arguments through um, things that ha are happening. And that can be a big event, that can be a moment in the sun, that can be you know, the logic of a piece of a legal text, that can be uh, something that was not said, that could be you know, uh, the effect of database upon our knowledge. It can be many kinds of things, uh, and not one of them, because they make different kinds of demands. And I want to find a way to weave between uh, concepts and the structure of, of dense example. Now there are ways to formalize this, and many of my colleagues across the human sciences do work that forces me to think uh, about my ability to do what I'm doing um, in what we would call theory. Um, but for my part in students' work, what I want them to do is to find a way to, to bridge uh, what I'm calling a structure of example with the structure of concept. Um, there are debates, for example, in sociology over whether theory should be, can be grounded, that is, whether it can emerge from specific uh, things in the world, or whether theory precedes the grounding of a given you know, range of human problems. But um, I think anthropologists would resist that sociological debate. Mm -hmm. Does theory precede, mm -hmm. or does theory follow? Um, as much as to say that we write in the face of events, and we're struggling always to produce concepts. So what I tend to say, but there's other ways that philosophers say this with greater elegance, and many other scholars, is that anthropology's ground is, is the situation. It's no longer society or culture. Uh, it's, 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 and like many forms of thought, and many forms of politics. And the question is, is I have to be adequate in two ways. I have to be adequate to saying, what is the situation here? Mm. What is the stakes of what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. What is the ground of this particular intervention? Mm -hmm. Even if my intervention will undo my understanding of that ground. What, and so I'm constantly struggling to be adequate to a situation. But at the same time, the situation is changing. I work in real time. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not simple. The, so I'm constantly trying to define the situation, which is not change, which is not sync still. Mm -hmm. And I'm constantly trying to be adequate to the situation that I'm defining. And my writing has to reflect both of that. You're trying to lead a reader into what is the situation? What are the stakes of it? And at the same time, you're trying to say, how am I, in some way, to be adequate to it? Um, and, which of course is impossible. You're not going to fully be, in most cases, adequate to many situations. But, um, but this is, again, a, a form of, of work, a form of ethics. Mm -hmm maybe to, to struggle to be adequate to the situation that you, in collective conversation, are struggling to define.